Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We all know the verse where we are instructed to walk by faith and not by sight. But what does that mean? It means when you find yourself in a very difficult situation, and when you look at the problem or the obstacle or the enemy that is against you, you see no way for success. And you are tempted to compromise, to turn away from your faith, to embrace the ways of the world. When you do that, you are walking by sight. But when you believe that God is all-powerful, that God is able to take victory where there is no visible means for victory, and you remain faithful and you do not compromise, but you do that which is right. You behave according to the truth, the instruction of the commandments of God. When you behave in such a manner, this is walking by faith. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 37. The book of Isaiah and chapter 37. Now, we've seen that the city of Jerusalem is in a dire situation. We have seen that the armies of Assyria has laid siege against this city. We have seen one nation after another nation fall to the king of Assyria, and also the smaller places around Jerusalem have been taken. And there's not really much hope for the people inside of Jerusalem if that hope is based upon what they can see with their eyes. But through faith, through the promises of God, through his instructions, we're going to see that victory takes place. God is able to make great changes in a moment. He is able to cause someone to do something that is against his own wishes, his own desires, his own purposes. God, in other words, is sovereign, and he can do exactly what his good will brings about. And that is victory for his covenant people. So again, let's begin. We've seen that, that the king Hezekiah, that he is relying upon prayer and prophecy. He has sent his faithful ones to Hezekiah or Isaiah, the prophet, in order to get instruction. And now notice what it says in verse 21, Isaiah 37 and verse 21. And Isaiah, the son of Amotz, he sent to Hezekiah. So now there's a response, a response from the prophet to the king in regard to what to do. And Hezekiah, Here's these words from Isaiah. He says, Thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, whom you have prayed unto me, meaning unto the king of, of all creation, the God of Israel. So the good news is this. There is a response. Isaiah he has heard from the Lord, and now he's going to reveal prophetically what God has told him for Hezekiah the king. And he says, you have prayed unto me concerning Sancharib, the king of Assyria. 
verse 22. This is the word which the Lord spoke concerning him. Now, we're going to see that, that Isaiah is going to give a proclamation prophetically in regard to the king of Assyria. And we need to remember that this man is full of himself. That is, he behaves in pride. He does not care what is right or wrong. He does according to his own desires. Now, you may succeed in that way for a moment, but you won't have, and hear this, you won't have kingdom success. You may achieve great things in your life from a human perspective, but you won't have any kingdom delight, any kingdom gratification, meaning that your eternity is going to be very, very different than the reality that you enjoyed when your life as a vapor you, you managed. Many people simply manage their life thinking that it will have no end. But they are behaving in a way in their mind that is going to bring about eternal destruction. And we're going to see this change and this, this termination of the king of Assyria is going to happen much quicker than he thought and in a way he could not imagine. So notice what it says in verse 22. This is the word which the Lord spoke concerning him. Now God prophetically is speaking to the king of Assyria and he says, you have, and this is a word for despise or to show contempt for someone. So God says, you have shown contempt. You have mocked. And who has he mocked? The virgin, the daughter of Zion. You have wagged your hair, head, you have wagged your head after, after the daughter of Jerusalem. Now, God had a purpose. God had a relationship, a covenant with the daughter of Zion, with the daughter of Jerusalem. And when it says virgin, what it's time to tell us is that this one was designated for the Lord God of Israel. This is his bride. And a bride and a groom, they build something together. And what is God going to build with his bride? The answer is a kingdom. And send Harif, the king of Assyria, he is moving to destroy the bride. He is moving to destroy the purpose of God. And therefore, we should know something. We should know that such a one will not be successful long. Whatever power that he may have, he may display whatever resources, even them being great resources, they are not going to endure for long. God is going to make a change, and oftentimes, God's change is rather abrupt. It changes quickly and in a way that no one can imagine. Look now to verse 23. He's still speaking directly, prophetically against the king of Assyria. And he says, and the context is, I'm speaking to you concerning me. God is speaking to the king of Assyria concerning himself. And he says, whom you have despised and whom you have blasphemed. According to whom? You have lifted up a voice, and your eyes, you have lifted them up exceedingly. Now, exceedingly here means to the high places, meaning that he has put himself in the same category as, as God belongs. He's saying, you have, have come to attack to act in a way and in a place that you don't belong. And it's all rooted in the pride of the king of Assyria. 
that he thinks he can battle the God of Israel. He says, you have lifted up your eyes, you have looked to the high places, to the Holy One of Israel. And I want to emphasize that term, the Holy One of Israel, meaning the God of Israel has a purpose for Israel. And Sanharif, the king of Assyria, has lifted himself up. He has a perspective. He has a plan that's against the purpose of God. Now, if you want to be successful, you make sure your life is submissive to the plan of God, the purposes of God. If you are deceived by the enemy, and I'm speaking about the devil, Satan, you will set a purpose for your life that is against the purposes of God. You are following deceit. You have believed a lie, and you're going to meet the same type of end as Sanharib, the king of Assyria. He says in verse 24, In the hands of your servants. Speaking to the king, he says, Through the power of Of your servants, in other words, you have disgrace. You have acted in a contemptuous way against the Lord. You have said, all this is directed to the king of Assyria. You have said, with the abundance of my chariots, I will go up once again to this place, Marom, to the high places. I will come into a different domain. He thinks that he's greater than humanity, that he, beyond that, that he is a type of God. And he says, I will go up to the high places of the mountains, to the extreme portions of Lebanon. Now, Lebanon, many scholars teach when it's mentioned, it's not so much talking about the location, but the trees of Lebanon that were used for the temple, meaning this is a spiritual battle, that Sanharif wants to come to Jerusalem to destroy, and we've seen this earlier, destroy the God of the Israelites to show that he is greater and the gods, the pagans that he, the pagan gods that he serves, are, are greater than the God of Israel. So he says, look at verse 24. It's with the the power of your servants that you have went up to the high mountains, to the, the ends of Lebanon. And you have said, I will cut down the heights of his cedars and the choice one of his cypress trees, and I will come to the end of the high place, meaning I'm going to arrive. This is Sennacherib's thought. I'm going to arrive to the end of this domain where, who is? The God of Israel. He thinks that he can wage war against the God of Israel and be successful. This is what he's saying. And we find that he wants to go to the force of the plentiful land. All of this is terminology saying, I'm coming into Israel. I'm going to go to the mountains of Zion. I am going to go to the Holy of Holies. And I am going to destroy the God of Israel and all the plentiful land that, that he says is his land. That's the intent. And now we see God's response. God has said what he has spoken to and about Sanharif. But now we're going to see God's response in a more, more exact way. How all of this is going to be carried out. Verse 25. God says, I have dug, meaning I have dug for, for wells and I have drank water. And likewise, he says, I have dried up with the steps of my my soles of my feet all the rivers of Egypt. 
So God's saying, if I want to have water, I dig and it's there. If I want to dry up the waters, Egypt plentiful with its Nile River and its tributaries that feed it, God says, I can dry it up like this. In other words, nothing is too great for God. He is over, sovereign over this, this creation. And he's saying this to Sanherib, the king of Assyria. Verse 26. Surely you have heard from a distance what I have done from the days of old, how I have created it, and now I bring it about. And it shall be for, and this word is an absolute catastrophe, a catastrophe for Sandharif. It's a word of annihilation, meaning this. All that Saint Harif is planning, all that he wants to accomplish is going to be annihilated. This is what he's saying. And there's going to be the heaps. It's literally the word for waves, but it's, it's a reference to the heaps of destruction is going to be your fortified cities. That's what he's telling him. All your strongholds are going to be a heap like waves of destruction for annihilation. Verse 27. Their inhabitants are, are short in power, meaning they're not going to, and the inhabitants of the strong, strong cities, the fortified cities, are soldiers, and he's saying they, they lack power. They're going to be dismayed. They're going to be made ashamed, and they're going to be like the, the grass of the field, like the herb of the greenlands, like the grass that is top of the roofs. Now, people would have a home, and they would have grass upon their roof, and they'll be like, like the, the cornfields before that it's their built up before they rise up, meaning this. If the corn is very, very short before it rises up, it's very susceptible to, to things. It can be injured and destroyed quite easily. And that's what God is saying. In the same way that, that grass is here today, gone tomorrow, that it doesn't take a lot to destroy the herbs of the, the field. Likewise, God is going to make easy destruction from San Kharif and his strongholds and his armies. Verse, verse 28. Your dwelling place, your going forth, your returning, I know. He's saying here, no matter where you dwell, no matter where you go out to, no matter where you come back, God knows why he is omniscient. He knows all things. He has perfect intelligence. He knows it all. And he says, and your anger, and this is a word for, for just shaking with anger, trembling, not with fear, but, but an uncontrollable anger, God says, against me. I know, he's saying, everything about you and your anger, your contempt for me. Verse 29. On account of your anger against me and the noise that went up into my ears, God says he's going to do this. I will set a hook, literally my hook, in your nose and my bridle between your lips, and I will bring you back in the way which you have come on it. So he's had a purpose. That purpose is to send his troops to Judah. Now he's already destroyed the northern kingdom, Israel, taking those tribes, nine plus tribes, into exile. And now there's only two tribes with some of the Levites. 
that are left in Judah. And people have fled, and Jerusalem is full of those who have tried to escape from the armies of Assyria. There's no food, there's no water. The city has been laid siege against. And the armies of Sancharif are are numerous there. With the eyes, no reason to think that there's victory and that victory is going to come quickly. But what does God say? Sancharif, because you have mocked, shown contempt, that you have disrespected, that you have blasphemed the God of Israel. Literally, he says, that you have done so against the daughter of Zion, the daughter of Jerusalem, my virgin bride. He says, because of this, he says, I will set my, my hook in your nose, my bridle in your lips, and I will bring you back on the way which you came upon it. Verse 30. Now he's going to say something to the children of Israel, that God is going to miraculously provide. He says here, look if you would to verse 30. He says, this to you is the sign. Eat this year the the safiach. Now what's that? That is the, the growth that comes up naturally. Now, usually it's not that plentiful, but God, in his sovereignty, that he is omnipotent, he can do all things. He is going to cause a supernatural growth to come up. And that's what the children of of Israel, those in Judah, are going to eat. That's for them this year. And he says... In the second year, and he uses the word, shachis. This is kind of the aftergrowth of the aftergrowth. Now, there's not much for the first year that comes up naturally, and there would even be much less the second year. But God supernaturally is going to provide for the people and allow them to have enough from this this two years of just eating what comes up, what you have not sown. But there's going to be a harvest that's going to supply for the people. And then God says, in the third year, it's all going to come to an end. In the third year, you will sow and you will reap. You will plant vineyards and eat from from their fruit. Verse 31. There's going to be, and verse 31 brings us into a very significant uh, concept. And that is the term in Hebrew, sharit, which is a remnant. We need to see prophetically, there's the remnant that's going to be the victors. That's going to be the kingdom inhabitants. And God says concerning this remnant, and the remnant is related to the faithful ones, the ones that trust the prophetic revelation. Verse 31, and again. Now, this is a continuation. It's a word of continuing something, meaning the end is not at hand. There is going to be a continuation, and it's those that are going to escape from the house of Judah. The ones who are going to remain And they're going to be like a root down below. And they will make fruit up above. So it's speaking simply about God is going to sow the remnant back in the land. They are not going to be put into exile. And if there's any exiles, ultimately, God is going to bring them back. He's going to plant them and they are going to be the root. And in the future, there's going to be a great harvest, there's going to be much fruit. The enemy is not going to be successful. The remnant is going to carry out God's will. Verse 32, for from Jerusalem, 
Now, even though this is a prophecy of what took place, what took place over 2,700 years ago, it teaches us about a future reality. The, the message of Isaiah is believe this, accept this, count on it, depend upon it because... This is what God's going to do in the last days. The same thing that he's going to deliver a remnant, and that remnant is going to produce great fruit. Look at verse 32. For from Zion shall go forth the remnant and the, the ones who escape. It just speaks about the escape. It speaks about those who are the, the refugees, the survivors. And they are going to go forth from Mount Zion. Now, all of this speaks about a people who have a kingdom hope. Zion is a word that relates to the kingdom. And it's all going to be brought about for one reason. Because of the merit of the Jewish people. Because of their, their own wisdom, their own ability. What they can bring about? No. What it says here, ki not Hashem sevaot ta zot, which means the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this, will do this. It's God's zeal for what? His plans, his purposes. Now, we need to pause and ask ourselves just a simple question. Do we have the zeal of the Lord? Are we going to be people despite what it looks like with our eyes? Don't walk by, by sight, walk by faith. And it's the zeal of the Lord that will propel us, move us forward in faith, to walk in the truth of God. That's what faith means, walk in truth, in the promises of God. So the zeal of the Lord of hosts, has, has done this. Verse 33. Therefore thus said the Lord to the king of Assyria, he will not come, and this is to him, but really concerning him. He will not come to this city. He will not shoot there an arrow. He will not move forward with the shield. He will not pour out upon it the ramp, and this is the ramp to get into the city, to go over the walls, to break through that last barrier. God is saying, none of those things, send Harif, are you going to do? But he proclaims this to the people of faith. He won't accomplish this, is what Isaiah is saying in the name of the Lord prophetically to the people. Verse 34, on the way which you came upon it, he will return. So on the way that Sen Harif came, he is going to return upon it. He will return, and again he says, and to this city, meaning obviously Jerusalem, he will not enter, declares the Lord. And that phrase, declares the Lord, is a term of promise. Now, again, I want to emphasize that, that the people, they would have heard this, and primarily it's to his Kiyahu, King Hezekiah. And he had to decide, am I going to take this to heart and believe it and endure and believe that God's going to provide supernaturally through through these, these harvests that are going to be done supernaturally, that the people are going to be fed and there will be that remnant, that, that faithful remnant that is going to survive and, and be fruitful. Is this going to happen? Or should I just surrender as the temptation has been to go out and pledge faith, allegiance to San Kharev and worship his gods. That's what the two options are. But God has promised that if you remain faithful, that he will bring about 
these things, that sin Harif will not enter into the city. Verse 35, God promises here, he says, and I will defend the city. Now, let me just pause and say, several times we see this city, this city, this city. And we know what we're talking about, Jerusalem. It is the city of the people of God. And that's why when, when someone says, oh, the land of Israel, that's in the past. The importance of Jerusalem, that's not, not the case. There is one false teacher. When, when his congregation wanted to send him to Israel, he says, you know, if you want to bless me, fix my, my car, pay for the, the mechanic bill. Don't, don't waste your money sending me to, to Israel, to the city of Jerusalem. Now, this is someone who has the mind of Messiah. Who, who the Holy Spirit is speaking to? Absolutely not. This one is, is far removed from the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the faith of Moses and the prophets and the faith that Messiah established and the, and the apostles spoke of. So he says, look at verse 35, I will defend this city to save it. Why? Well, people will say, and the same individual, he says, you know, the, the Jewish people are rebellious, covenant-breaking people. God has, has cut them off. All of these promises, all of these things are, are no longer. They're rendered void. Really. But what God says here, and I realize this is going to be fulfilled in the days of Isaiah, 2,700 years ago. But it's written down for us in the future, for Israel in the future. He says here, and why, do I, why am I so sure about this? Notice what he says. I will defend this city to save it on account of myself, on account of David, my servant. David, David. He's speaking about the promise he made to David, and we can understand this as a messianic promise. Now, here's the key. In the same way that the people had to be brought back, now this is before the Babylonian exile, God says you're not going to go into exile by Sancheriv, the Assyrians. But the people weren't faithful. And Nebuchadnezzar came and carried them into Babylon where they were in exile 70 years. But God was faithful. At the right time, he brought the people back. Why? For the sake of my servant David, meaning the Messiah. And what we're finding now is in the same way that God returned the people to the land after the Babylonian captivity, so Messiah could come the first time. He's also returning the people for his sake, not because of, of the Israelis' merit. They deserve it. They've earned it. No. It's because of God and God alone, his promise, his word, his character, that he is going to bring back, as he has done and as he is doing, the people back to the land. So Messiah can do what he said he's going to do, and when he comes back, He's not coming back to New York. He's not coming back to, to London or Paris or Rome. He's not coming back to Beijing or, or any other major capital. He's coming back to the capital of the land of Israel, the capital for the Jewish people, Jerusalem. This is where he's returning to, and it testifies of his importance of this city to God in the future. That's why the kingdom of God in its final state is called the New Jerusalem. So he says, all of this is on account of David, my servant, which is a reference to Messiah. Verse 36. In order to bring this about, notice it says, and the angel of the Lord went forth. Not an army of angels, just one, 
God can do whatever. Just with one angel, this is a unique angel, the angel of the Lord. He went out and he struck the camp of the Assyrians. And 185,000 he struck. And the people, those who were left, got up in the morning and, and they saw, behold, all of them. Now, this could be referring to not the survivors from Assyria, but perhaps those in the city of Jerusalem. They got up early in the morning and behold, all of them, they were dead corpses. And the implication is on the ground. Verse 37. And he traveled, we're speaking about the king of Assyria. He traveled and he went and he returned. Who's this? Sancharif, the king of, uh, king of Assyria. He traveled and he went and he returned and he dwelt in Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was, was his place. We know about Nineveh from the book of Jonah and the book of Nahum. And we see that he went to this place. And why did he do this? Verse 38. And it came about as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his God. So he went into the temple of Nisroch, his God. And as he was doing this, notice what it says. Two men, men by the name of Ad-Ramelech and Sar-Atzar, who were they? They were his sons. And they struck him with the sword. And they fled to the lands, the land of Ararat. And what happened? It says, his other son, by the name of Esar-Hadan, He ruled in his place. Now, God, at the time that he prophesies his proclamation, he brings about the fulfillment of his word. This is a testimony to the authority of God and the power of God to carry out what he says. And if we are wise enough, humble enough, of faith, we are going to put into practice the word of God. We are going to take prophetic instruction, apply it to our life. We're not going to be concerned with how everything looks to us because God, like that, can bring about change. It can be a dark hour. The defeat can be approaching, and God can say no and bring about a change. I'm sure San Harif didn't think that he was going to return back to Nineveh. I'm sure when he went in to worship his pagan god, I'm sure that he did not know his two sons were going to kill him with a sword. He was not prepared for what God had proclaimed. He didn't know the prophetic truth of the word of God. And let me close with this. If you don't know the prophetic word of God, you're going to miss out on the promises of God and experience that which is God's judgment. Just that simple. Prophecy prepares us. And that's why we see so frequently in the Gospels that it was prophecy being fulfilled in the days of Yeshua that that the people should have known, so they could have responded faithfully. But because they didn't, we know the Roman exile took place. So determine at this moment, are you going to walk by sight and experience defeat, or walk by faith and be recipients of the promises of God? I'll close at this time. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. 
There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.